This is one of the prison epistles of Paul. He wrote this letter chained to Roman soldiers while under house arrest in Rome. He was awaiting trial. He did not know if he would be vindicated and released or convicted and executed. But during this season of uncertainty, Paul was not filled with worry, doubt, and fear. He responded to his circumstances with prayer. And we see in our text that he did not just pray about his own circumstances. He prayed for other people. No doubt Paul prayed that lost people would be saved, but Paul's prayer reports typically focus on the needs of the saints. This is what we find here in his prayer for the Ephesians. He is praying for the needs of the saints. We don't know exactly what their circumstances were, and scholars suggest that this is a circular letter and that Paul himself did not know the specific circumstances of the readers of this letter. But yet he prays confidently for his readers. He does not pray about physical sickness, financial challenges, family problems, personal goals, or worldly success. He prays about the things that matter the most. He prays with spiritual priorities. He prays about heart-level issues that are at work underneath the skin. In a real sense, Paul prays for their greatest need, even though he did not know their need. He prayed, that is, about their true need rather than just their felt need. He prayed about what they needed the most. He prayed that they would know God better. And without knowing your business, I declare that's what you need the most. You need to know God better. More than money, more than a new job, more than healing, more than relief from enemies, more than deliverance or breakthrough, the most important need in your life is to know God better. And the most important need in my life is to know God better. Prayer is the means by which we are able to know God better. In the verses before us, Paul shows us how to pray to know God better and what to pray to know God better. First, consider how to pray to know God better. Verse 15 says, for this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, that opening clause for this reason points back to the hymn of grace in verses 3 through 14. Those verses, as I mentioned, celebrate the sovereign grace of God that has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. God the Father chose us before the foundation of the world. God the Son has redeemed us by the blood of his cross. God the Holy Spirit has sealed us until we receive the full inheritance of our salvation. God, in other words, has your past covered, your present covered, and your future covered. But even though Paul was confident that our salvation was safe in the hands of a sovereign God, he still prays for the saints. In fact, he declares God is sovereign and then says, for this reason, I'm praying for you. This is confusing to many. People ask, if God is real, why pray? I mean, if he already knows everything, if he has control over everything, and if God is going to do whatever God wants to do anyway, why bother to pray? There are a couple of stock answers I pull off the shelf when I get that question. Uh, first, you should pray because the word of God commands it. It's just a matter of obedience. Secondly, you should pray. Hold to your pew because prayer works. 
That's the other reason why you ought to pray. Those, those are just fundamental reasons. I can just pull off the shelf. But, but our text gives us several other reasons why you ought to pray. Namely, the progression of the text seems to teach us today that true worship naturally flows into believing prayer. The sign that you praise right will be that you pray right. Likewise, the connection of these passages teach us that we will not be able to access or appropriate the blessings that are ours in Christ without prayer. And you will never understand fully the truth of who you are in Christ without prayer. God is sovereign. But Paul says, I still need to pray so that you know how great this God is who is on your side. And so he begins to report in verses 15, 16, and in the beginning of verse 17, how he prays for the saints. There is a lesson here in both the content and the character of Paul's prayer. We learn something from both his instruction and his example. He teaches us not just what to pray, but how to pray. And the first thing I would note as quickly as I can is that the text teaches us to pray for one another. Paul says, for this reason, because I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints. He says, I've been moved to pray for you because I heard some stuff about you. That's, that's a good way to respond when you hear stuff. He says, I heard some things about you and, and I responded by praying for you. I didn't just hear bad stuff. Sometimes we are only moved to pray for other people when we hear bad news of personal sin or physical sickness or family trouble or financial reversal or other difficult circumstances. But Paul says, I, I got a good report about you. And the good news moved me to pray. I, I was moved to pray when I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints. If I could summarize that. Paul says, I, I was moved to pray for you because I heard you are saved. You were born again. You've been washed in the blood of the Lamb. Your, your name is written on high. You, you on your way to heaven. We, we in the same family. You, you're fellow Christians. I, I heard that, that you are in Christ as well. And he says, because we are part of the same spiritual family, when I heard that I had brothers and sisters I didn't know about, it moved me to pray for you. I got to move on. I can't linger here. But something is wrong with your prayer life if you can constantly bombard the Father's throne but never have a concern for the needs of other people. Paul says, I, I heard that I had brothers and sisters I didn't know about, and I was moved to pray for you. How did I know you were in the family? He says, because I heard two things. I heard your faith in the Lord Jesus. That's how you get in the family. Notice he didn't say, I heard you perform good works, because that's not what gets you in the family. Uh, keeping the Ten Commandments won't get you in the family. Living by the golden rule won't get you in the family. Doing charitable works won't get you in the family. Joining church will not get you in the family. Getting baptized will not get you in the family. To get in the family, you got to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9 says, By grace you have been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It is a gift of God, not of works, so that no man may boast about his salvation. He says, I know you're in the family because you got faith. And this is not just faith in general. This is faith in the right object. 
faith in the Lord Jesus. That's what saves. Big faith in the wrong object leads to big trouble. But just mustard seed faith in the Lord Jesus can move mountains in your life. He says, I, I heard your faith is in the right object. You have true saving faith. It's in the Lord Jesus. You got to have faith to be saved, but, but he says, don't put your faith in the preacher. Don't put your faith in the church. Don't put your faith in other Christians. People will let you down. Don't, don't, and, and, and don't, 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 don't let, don't let people run you away from the Lord. No one in here has a heaven to take you to or hell to send you to. Don't, don't put your faith in people. Put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, I heard, first of all, about your faith. But then he says, I heard about your love for all the saints. It is true love. The word here for love is the word used throughout the New Testament to describe God's love for us. And God's love for us is more than a feeling. It's an action. In Scripture, love is not just warm emotions. Love is sacrificial action. Love is what you do. God so loved the world that he gave. He did something. And this love, he says, is true love that I hear about you. It's love that moves your heart to do something. It's true love, but it's targeted love. You love the saints. Both go together. Not just here, but just run it through the New Testament, and you'll see faith and love go together. You, you can't have faith in Jesus without having love for the saints. You, 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 can't, you can't be connected to the shepherd but disconnected from the flock. You, 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 can't, you can't be in communion with the head and be detached from the body. You, 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 can't, you can't love the groom and hate the bride. To have faith in the Lord Jesus is to have love for the church. 1 John 3.14 says we know. That we have passed from death to life because we love our brothers. And whoever does not love his brother abides in death. This is true love. It's targeted love to the saints. And then it's total love. Do you see that? You don't just love some saints. Certain saints. Or special saints. Paul says... Because I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, verse 16, I do not cease to give thanks for you. Hear me. Thanksgiving is essential to prayer. Thanksgiving should be your response when prayer is answered. But Thanksgiving should also be your practice when prayer is offered. Don't wait till you get what you ask for to thank God. As you pray, give thanks. Paul prayed with thanksgiving. And he was not just thankful for the things in his life. He was also thankful for the people in his life. He gave thanks. For the church at Ephesus, in fact, he says, since I heard about your faith and love, I do not cease to give thanks for you. And it causes me to remember you in my prayers. Thanksgiving will help you pray better. It's hard to keep praying for people and be mad at them at the same time. You just, it just doesn't work. You try it. It doesn't work. The, the more thankful you are, the, the better it'll benefit your prayers. Paul says, I have been thanking God for you without ceasing. And it has caused me to be remembering you in my prayers. Pray for one another, church. Pray with thanksgiving. But also, in terms of how to pray to know God better, you should pray with confidence in God. 
before Paul gets to the contents of his prayer in verse 17, we see his invocation, how he addressed God in prayer. This is an important part of the prayer, not just thanksgiving, but invocation, how you address God. You, you ought to address God in prayer in a way that reminds you of who you are talking to. And, and, and Paul said, before I tell you what I pray, let me tell you who I prayed to. He says in verse 17, I've been asking the God of our Lord Jesus Christ and the Father of glory to do some things for you. Mm. In other words, he wants to give his readers assurance that he is praying with confidence. Church, you too can pray with confidence. You could pray with confidence in the goodness of God. This is what Paul means when he calls God the God of our Lord Jesus Christ. You can pray with confidence in the goodness of God. You do know God is good, don't you? But, but how do you know God is good? Not just that he woke you up this morning and started you on your way and put bread on your table and a roof over your head and clothed you in your right mind gave you a reasonable portion of health and strength. He did all of that. But, but, but that's, that's, not, that's not the real proof that God is good. Sometimes we wonder if God is good when we look at bad things, but, but it's not the circumstances of life that declare the goodness of God. Mm -mm. If you want to know that God is good, run to the cross and look at Jesus. This is a definitive statement of the character of God. And this is what Paul means when he says that I've been praying to the God of the Lord Jesus Christ. If he was just God, he would be holy and vengeful and wrathful and angry. But he's not just God. He's the God of the Lord Jesus Christ, which means he is a good God. He is the God who sent his son into the world to die on the cross for our sins that we might have a fresh start, a new beginning, and another chance. God is good. When you think about the Lord Jesus Christ, and it ought to give you confidence to pray. There was a family that lived near us. They recently moved. But there was a boy in the family who uh, spent a lot of time uh, in and out of our house. And uh, my youngest sister was visiting us a couple years ago during the holiday, and we're sitting in the living room, and the garage door burst open, and little Blake comes running in. Hi, as he keeps running, and just passes right on by, going to the bottom of the stairs, looking for HV. And my sister's looking at me like, well, what's going on here? I said, oh, don't worry. That's my son's friend. He came back and uh, he said, uh, HB's not up there. <laughs> he's, he's not here. Where is he? Um, he's on his way home. Well, he's usually home by now. <laughs> and I said, well, I don't know what to tell you. He should be home soon. And he just bolted out the door. And my sister was kind of like, you let that little boy talk to you like that? <laughs> I said, that's my son's friend. He, he'd come by and pick up the kids to play. And, you know, since he was standing there, he'd be in Crystal's pantry. And if there's some snacks there, he'd grab him some <laughs> snacks. And he'd get away with it because he, he was my son's <laughs> friend. What right do you think you have to come before the throne of God and ask anything and expect the favor of God in return? We are sinful. Our hearts are filled with iniquity. We have transgressed the will of God based on our goodness. We don't deserve anything from the Lord. 
but our great high priest is sitting by the Father's right hand. And when you come to God in prayer, the Son says to the Father, don't worry, Daddy, that's my friend. And because God is the God of the Lord Jesus Christ, we can pray with confidence in the goodness of God. But not only can you pray with confidence in the goodness of God, you can also pray with confidence in the glory of God. Still in verse 17, he is not just the God of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is, says Paul, the Father of glory. Usually Father of means creator of, but the text is not here trying to say that God is the creator of glory. It's saying he is the Lord of glory. He is the infinitely glorious Father. His glory is the sum total of his glorious great attributes. And it is the hope for our future. Watch this. To say that he is the father of uh, the God of the Lord Jesus Christ means he's got my yesterday under control. But to say he's the father of glory is to say he's got my future under control. Do you hear me? And so it doesn't matter what's going on in my life. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. And I can pray with confidence that he is able to hear and answer my prayer. That's how to pray to know God better. But let me rush to say a word about what to pray to know God better. Ah. Uh, Ray Pritchard, in a chapter in his book on this text, says that prayer is the thermometer of the soul. You, you, you want to tell me what somebody believes, don't tell me what they say, tell me what they pray. Paul here gives us a thermometer toward his soul by recording for us what he prays. He's not praying for little, temporal, worldly things. He's praying God-sized, God-exalting, God-glorifying prayers. He first makes the main petition. He says, I've been talking to the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory. He said, let me tell you what I've been asking. That he would grant you or give you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. Let me give you the bottom line. I've been praying, asking God to help you know God better. Spirit, God guarantees you a spirit knows the nature of this knowledge. This is not something you can figure out on your own. This is a spiritual issue. Wisdom refers to spiritual insight. Uh, Charles Swindoll has my favorite definition of wisdom. He says, Wisdom is the God-given ability to see life with rare objectivity and to respond to life with rare stability. It's to see life right and to respond to life right. He says, I'm asking God that he would give you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation. That's the source of the knowledge of God. That God would reveal himself to you. You cannot figure God out on your own. God must reveal himself. And he says, I'm praying that God will give you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. And the word here, knowledge, is intensified in the language. It is personal, deep, intimate knowledge. He's saying, I'm praying that you not just know about God, but that you fully know God. Are you still with me? Uh, I know President Barack Obama. I don't know if I told y'all that. I know him. 
says, son. If he comes on the news, I don't even have to be watching. I hear his voice and I say, oh, yeah, the president's on the news. I know his, I know where his voice comes from. I know what he looks like. I could tell you things about his biography. I know his wife. I know his children. I got his books. I, I know about his training. I know about his accomplishments. I know about his political positions. I, I've even gotten a Christmas card <laughs> with the president's signature on it and a letter of congratulations. I know the president, but I don't really know the president. <laughs> I, I, I don't know him, and he doesn't know me. But I know my wife, Crystal. I met her in Coach Williams' class in high school. And we've known each other for decades now, literally years. I've gotten to know her over the years personally. And it, I know things about her that no one else knows. We, we have unspoken means of communication because we know each other. Um, I know her well enough that I can look at her and say, what's wrong? And she say nothing, and I still know something wrong. <laughs> you get where I'm going? I know about President Obama, but I know my wife. And Paul says, I'm praying that God will do something in your life so that you don't just know about God, but you know him personally intimately and deeply for yourself. And I'm going to say it again. This is the greatest need in your life. More than money. More than healing. More, more than your children to act right. More than your mate to stop tripping. More than uh, things to move out on your job. You, you, you need to know God better. And I'm trying to say, friend, that if you just know God better, all that rest of that other stuff will just kind of, you, you can deal with that better when you know God better. <laughs>